Hi everyone. I am Ashank. Uh, I work as a software engineer in the storage team at CERN, and I'll be talking about a few of the developments which we've been working on uh, on own cloud infinite scale and Riva, which has resulted in a complementary symbiosis, which in turn has enabled us to develop a plethora of features which we've been wanting to implement, as well as which has been desired by a few consumers. So by now, I'm pretty sure you're all aware of what OSIS is. Uh, let me give you a background into Riva as well. Uh, first, let's look into why we needed it in the first place. Uh, traditionally, a lot of enterprise file sync and share systems used to have ad hoc bindings for various applications and storage backends. Uh, for example, we can have Code EMD running at CERN, and that might be tightly bound to EOS, which is a storage backend. Uh, there could be another the deployment, which could have other office apps with their custom bindings. So this resulted in a fragmentation problem, uh, which made porting these applications from one deployment to the other pretty difficult. Also, uh, these integrations differ, slight, differ significantly across applications. So even when you want to integrate a new application, you couldn't utilize the old code because it was very specific to the older application. Uh, Riva looks to solve these issues by providing an interoperable middleware to which own cloud connects seamlessly. It has driver uh, implementations for various functionalities such as storage backends, authentication mechanisms, file sharing, uh, and applications. And adding new ones is as simple as just implementing that particular interface. And these functionalities are in turn exposed via a set of universal APIs called CS3 APIs. And we've been running Riva in production for the last three years, where it supports 30,000 users. Uh, let's go behind the scenes and look into exactly how this interoperability is provided. So you can have multiple instances of a given service type running simultaneously. And each of these instances can talk a different language and support different drivers. So for authentication mechanisms, you can have basic bearer and OIDC auth all running at the same time. You could have multiple storage mounts. Uh, these can include EOS, OSIS, and S3 mounts. And you can have multiple apps from editing applications to scientific notebooks. The, uh, and these applications could be only Office, Collabora, JupyterLab, CodeMD, and so on. And adding a new instance is as simple as writing a couple of lines of config and just firing up a new Riva daemon. But how does Riva know where these instances run and how does it know where to redirect the appropriate requests to? So this happens via dynamic rule-based registries. So each of these uh, individual services register themselves to central registries in the gateway services and that and those gateway services are responsible for deciding which instance to forward a given user request to. For example, uh, uh, let's say you have an EOS driver running at on a particular machine, uh, which knows that it only talks to the EOS instance, which serves users whose username start with A. So we instruct Riva about this. And whenever a user request comes, uh, trying to access a resource, which starts with, if the username starts with A, uh, Riva knows where to read the, the request to. Also for authentication mechanisms, uh, let's say you have two machines, uh, both running the basic auth driver. Uh, Riva has uh, mechanisms which would allow it to, uh, to dynamically balance the load and choose either of these two machines when it uh, gets a request uh, of basic auth. So this all happens dynamically and firing up new Riva demons, like I said, is pretty simple. Uh, let's look into how Riva fits in the OSIS ecosystem. So if you look at the diagram, uh, you can see the various uh, Riva services uh, which uh, run, and these ensure seamless functioning of the whole system. So the Riva components are the ones present in yellow. Uh, in the front end, we have the data gateway HTTP service through which the actual data transfer happens. The OCS layer, which allows you to manipulate shares. The OCM service, uh, OCM stands for Open Cloud Mesh, and this facilitates federated sharing and resource access. And there's a WebDAV service to which web, web and desktop clients connect for various uh, storage operations. Uh, then you can have multiple auth providers, multiple storage backends, 
the user share provider, the public share provider, and all of these can be easily configured to suit your requirements. Uh, now I would like to give you a 10,000 foot view of some of the recent developments we've been making to the Riva and OSIS symbiosis. So let's start with the most recent feature that we've been working on, which is application integration. So the aim of this integration is to reach a stage where you can have a Pandora's box of applications at your fingertips as easily as possible. From office apps such as only Office, Collabora, Office 365, to scientific notebooks operated via Jupyter Hub, to markdown editing via CodeMD, Latex projects, and so on and so forth. A colleague of mine, Jan Maria, has also worked on integrating root.js with OSIS, which allows visualizing and making sense out of physics data. So if you missed this presentation from the workshop yesterday, please do check it out once it's uploaded. And you can just bring your own app. We made it ridiculously easy to write bindings for new applications. Uh, now, how have, how have we made this integration so easy, you might ask? So it's due to a uniform protocol for editing apps called WAPI and its implementation, which we've, which we've developed here at CERN. Uh, WAPI stands for Web Application Open Platform Interface. And like I mentioned, it provides a universal set of APIs to connect to a range of editing apps. We already have a few apps at production, uh, in production at CERNbox and are working actively on integrating new ones. Uh, the new ones include Etherpad, and in the future, maybe even Latex IDEs. Uh, we've implemented multi-log support so that people can collaborate uh, on these documents via different types of clients. And we've also made the discovery and registration of supported extensions and mind types extremely dynamic. Uh, let's go over the architecture of this integration in brief. So, here in this particular scenario, we have three instances of the Riva app provider, all of the, them running the same code, but they've been configured to talk to different apps. So uh, one talks to only Office, one to CodeMD, and the third to Collabora. Now to discover the various uh, extensions that uh, these apps support, we need to make a call to the hosting discovery URL, which returns to us a dictionary of the various extensions which it supports. For CodeMD, this is not needed because we know that it supports Markdown and TXT files. So once this discovery happens, uh, these apps individually register themselves to the app registry. Uh, the app registry is responsible for knowing where to redirect particular requests to, and also for populating the list of various extensions to be provided to the user. So the user can know that they can create new files of these particular types. Now, once this registration happens, we can just start uh, uh, editing documents. And this editing happens via the WAPI server. So all of these app provider instances would talk to WAPI server, which would in turn talk to, to the individual apps and provide you a URL or a URL object, in fact, uh, to which you can just connect from your browser or from any other client and just seamlessly edit documents. Uh, let's move on to the second feature now. RBAC mechanisms. So we've recently introduced this concept to Riva. RBAC or role-based access control allows us to generate and operate around fine-grained permissions. Uh, this wasn't available before. And this provides a much more secure and efficient syncantia system. So let's look into a scenario which demonstrates why this was needed in the first place. Uh, let's say you create a public share for a particular file and you forward that uh, link to a wide audience. Now, when the audience want, when, when someone from the audience wants to access that file, they send a request to the public files endpoint uh, and they do a prop find. So the HTTP WebDAV service tries to see if uh, that particular share exists or not. So once you provide the ID of this public share, it makes a call to the share manager to see if that share exists. Uh, now we have a microservices based architecture. So the share manager is a totally separate service. It just looks it looks the ID up in its database, and if it finds the ID, it returns the share object. So now the HTTP layer knows that okay, this share actually exists, and it was created by the user Alice. So it talks to the authentication manager to generate a token for this user Alice, and the authentication manager knows that this is the only way to authorize public shares. So it gives the whole uh, token through which you can access Alice's whole namespace. 
so uh, the security threat to which this uh, mechanism poses is pretty obvious. Uh, we are exposing the whole token, which allows access uh, to the share creator's whole namespace. And if this is being misused by an attacker, they can just manipulate resources, delete files, access content, which they shouldn't have uh, access to. Uh, this and in addition to the security threats, uh, there are various limitations which prevented us from addressing some potential use cases. So let's say you want to grant access to a particular folder to a third party app. Uh, that app may speak WebDAV or let's say you just want to run some script on some particular namespace. There was no way to do this previously without exposing your password or Riva access token, which had complete permissions. And there's another really popular use case of negative permissions. So let's say you've shared a resource with a large group, but you want to deny access to one member of the group. This couldn't have been done before. And to fix all these shortcomings, uh, scopes come to our rescue. So we've designed this uh, while taking inspiration from OAuth two scopes, but uh, they're custom ones uh, which match the requirements of a sync and share system. So now you can generate tokens with restricted privileges. Uh, these can include a right access to a public share, and this would solve the security issue which we previously discussed. Uh, we've also introduced lightweight accounts, uh, and these are for users who don't own a storage space but uh, the, these users can access shares created with them. I'll be talking about these in detail next. Now, if you also want to generate temporary passwords for other applications, you can do those. Uh, so we have this new service for application passwords. You can specify which folder you want to restrict access to, and it will give you a temporary password, which you can write in a script or just provide to any third party app. Uh, lightweight accounts. Uh, as I previously mentioned, these are needed for users who don't have a space of their own in a particular storage backend. But you, the question might be, do we even need those? We can just create public links and that should work. So the problem is it doesn't work. Collaboration at CERN happens across boundaries and institutes. We have a lot of uh, researchers coming from other institutes as well as remote work happening. And uh, by now, I'm pretty sure that you know that the LHC produces data at a rate of terabytes per second. So the need to share this data with other collaborators is there is this need. People did use to use public links as a workaround for this, but it introduced a couple of problems. It was not scalable. How many public links can you create? And how do you keep a track of this? There's no you, there, there is a pain where you can get all these public links, but as the number of collaborators grow, as the number of files you want to share grow, this doesn't scale. So the solution to this issue is, like I said, lightweight accounts. So we allow end users to create lightweight accounts, and this can happen via edugain or any social logins. So if your key cloak or your identity management supports this, then Revo works with that. So you can sign up using your Facebook account, your, your Gmail account, or even your university account. And uh, people who have storage spaces can share this with you, can share resources with you, and you can access them uh, by logging in, into the EFSS. Now, another development that arose because of the way Cernbox operates is the need for a pluggable account management system. So OSIS has provisions which allow you to manage users and accounts. So you can create new accounts, modify the existing ones, delete uh, those uh, delete those accounts for users who leave the organization and whatnot. But at CERN, we have a central uh, custom service uh, which is based on REST API uh, through which all this happens. Uh, so it works in collaboration with the key cloak, but, uh, but it exposes some custom endpoints uh, which uh, any central service won't know of. So there was no way to get around this other than to write our own adapter. So if you have an existing IAM service as well, you can just code your own driver as well. And with the recently developed feature of runtime plugins, your code doesn't even have to live in Riva or even be exposed to Riva. But yeah, you can just integrate closed source solutions. Uh, this functionality was added as part of a GSOC project this summer 
and our student Jamil uh, will talk about this after this presentation. So please uh, attend that if you're interested. Yeah. So these are the interfaces that you need to implement to have your own custom solution integrated. For Authenticator, you just need to have an Authenticate method, which takes an ID and a secret and returns you the user object and the scope that object has access to. Similarly, for the user provider, you have methods to get users, search for users, get the groups a user belongs to, and so on and so forth. So this is these are pretty easy to write and really easy to integrate. Now, we've also revamped the data gateway service, uh, which I mentioned previously. Uh, and this is the service through which data uploads and downloads take place. Now, let's look at how the workflow is in the, in the service. So a client wants to upload a file. Uh, let's consider it to be a mobile client in this case. Uh, it wants to upload a file called test.txt. So Riva responds with an endpoint. So you can call the data endpoint and a token, which contains some metadata, which would be decoded by Riva. So the client is pretty happy with this. And it sends a put request to that endpoint and this attaches the token. But it receives a pretty cryptic response, TUS header not found. So if you're an old client, you might not know what TUS is. Yeah. Uh, TUS, by the way, is a new upload protocol uh, which we've integrated in Revianosis and it allows resumable uploads. But with the revamp service, how this happens is if the client wants to upload a file, Riva responds with the endpoint, the token, and all the protocols which it supports. So previously, you could only run one protocol at, at a time, but now we support all of those, and it's up to the client to choose uh, which it wants to use. So yeah, if it's an old client, it can just use the old chunking protocols, and uh, Riva would be able to write those files easily. Uh, we also have user agent-based capabilities, so now if you want to restrict a particular type of clients to use only a specific protocol that can be arranged via the config as well. And yeah, uh, let's look at science mesh now. So this is a, a European project which aims at enabling collaboration across deployments and EFSSs. So Kuba from CERNbox uh, talked about this in detail earlier today. His presentation was titled Science Mesh in a nutshell. So please check that out if you're interested. And as part of this project, we have a lot new integrations uh, inside of OnCloud and OSIS. So we now have integrated Artlone, which is a tool to sync across various storage backends. So it supports WebDAV. So, and now it's integrated with uh, Riva. So you can just sync your two deployments or you can even sync various clouds. You can sync your own cloud deployment with, let's say, AWS or Google Cloud Provider. Uh, we've also integrated Indico, which is an event management app developed at CERN, uh, and also Rusio. Rusio is another data transfer tool uh, which works in the worldwide computing grid at CERN, at CERN. And this was integrated as part of a GSOC project uh, this summer. Now, one thing uh, which uh, we would like to improve on is adding arbitrary storage and app providers. So at CERNbox, uh, we have nine sharded EOS storage instances, and we have six plus applications, and we're adding more. Uh, but adding new uh, providers is not as straightforward in OSIS as it is in Riva. In Riva, you just have to add a new config file. Uh, now, the workaround for this is uh, you spawn separate Riva instances and you specify the registry rules inside of OSIS. And then OSIS would just know where to redirect these requests to. But uh, we are working on adding this functionality inside OSIS itself, so you don't need to spawn these instances separately. And once this is done, it would make the life of sysadmins even more easier. And a detailed uh, account of our deployment uh, was described by Samuel previously. So yeah, uh, his, uh, his presentation just happened before mine. And yeah, to conclude, uh, we've been working on a lot, a lot of new features which uh, would make the life of users a lot better than before. 
and we've been collaborating extensively with own cloud and other partners and this collaboration is proving to be really fruitful uh, we we're both developing features which would be of extremely extremely large use to all our consumers but there's still a long way to go to reach an ecosystem where the own cloud plus sandbox is what your operating system is all about so as soon as you turn your laptop all you need to do is switch on to osis and you have all functionalities there so that is the milestone which we aim to reach and we're definitely on the right track there and yeah that's it from my end. uh thank you so much for listening